ductal carcinoma in situ of the breast. This is one of a series of cancer videos that can be found on the website about cancer.com. This is specific to the management and treatment of ductal carcinoma in situ of the breast. About 20% of breast cancers in the United States now are diagnosed at this early stage, so-called stage zero or non-invasive ductal cancer. These patients are a bit younger than patients with invasive breast cancer. This makes some sense because this is thought to be the earliest stage of breast cancer and occurs prior to invasive breast cancer. The five-year survival with ductal carcinoma in Site 2 or Stage 0 should be virtually close to 100%. In order to understand the management and treatment of this disease, it's necessary to understand some basic anatomy, the lobules, the ducts, the lymph nodes, a little bit about the pathology or the pathology report, how aggressive the cancer is, something about breast imaging, what mammograms show, and how this all fits together into the staging system. In theory, the anatomy of the breast is shown here. The most important structures for our purposes are the lobules that make the milk and the ducts that carry the milk. It's the ducts that go bad with ductal carcinoma in situ. The earliest stage is the duct cells go bad and become hyperplastic or so-called atypical hyperplasia and then actually become malignant called intraductal cancer cells. If left untreated, they will break through the wall or the basement membrane of the duct and become infiltrating or invasive ductal cancer. So in this diagram, a blow up of the milk duct, you can see the lumen of the milk duct with a basement membrane and cells hanging into the duct. These would be normal milk duct cells. If they become abnormal, they become hyperplastic and then atypical hyperplasia, and then become actually malignant cells. So this would be ductal carcinoma in situ, but you can see they have yet to invade the basement membrane. And if untreated, eventually these cells will probably break through the basement membrane, and then it's classified as invasive or infiltrating breast cancer. And here's a microscopic view of this. There's a large group of cancerous duct cells in a large ball in the center of this slide, but it's well within the lumen or the walls of the milk duct and has not invaded. So this is typical ductal carcinoma in situ of the breast. The word in situ is from Latin meaning in place, meaning the cells have not yet invaded. The lymph nodes can be involved, but in general, ductal carcinoma in situ should not spread to the lymph nodes unless there is some early invasion, often called microinvasion. About 10 to 20 percent of women whose original biopsy showed only DCIS will be found to have early invasion at the time of the surgical excision or the lumpectomy. So again, in summary, DCIS is cancer in the walls of the duct. As long as they stay in the duct, it's called in situ. If it breaks through the walls of the duct, it's called infiltrating or invasive breast cancer. And this is classified as stage zero. Tumor category is called TIS for in situ. The lymph node should be so-called N0, meaning low, no lymph node involvement. Other things to understand on a PATH report, again, besides whether this is invasive and the histology, which is ductal, is called the GRADE, or these fast or slow-growing cancer cells. The hormone receptors, is it sensitive to estrogen or progesterone? And HER2 or genetic abnormalities, though these are not considered important at the present time for DCIS. All of these topics are covered in more detail in some of the other videos on our website. Imaging is important, as uh, noted on the table on the right. In the cells, the ducts become abnormal. They're called hyperplasia. They become more abnormal. They're called atypical ductal hyperplasia. And when they become malignant, DCIS, they sit there and eventually can outgrow their blood supply and basically die off, which is called necrosis, and then they calcify. So the pathologist will be looking for small specks of abnormal calcification in the breast, often called microcalx or microcalcification, which is basically calcifying dead or necrotic ductal cells. So mammograms often will find calcifications. There are common benign calcifications, as shown here, and the radiologist normally has no trouble distinguishing these. About 90% of women with DCIS will have microcalcifications 
on their mammograms and looking at it another way, uh, about 80% of all breast cancers that present with calcifications will be found to be pure DCIS. Here's some typical examples of some early areas of calcifications. The panel on the left is a small area that was pure DCIS. When the, the panel in the middle, where there's a larger area, turned out to have some early invasion, and the area on the right, which was an even bigger pattern, was found to also have already developed invasive breast cancer. Here's another example of a very subtle area of micro calcifications. This biopsy only showed 8 millimeters of DCIS. Here's another one with a small patch of abnormal white calcifications. We circled them in yellow. This was pure DCIS with some focal microinvasion at the time of the final lumpectomy. This patient had an even larger area of microcalcifications, and no surprise, it turned out to have high grade DCIS plus invasive ductal cancer. You can see how the fat area of the breast looks black, and it's easy to see calcifications in that area. But if the woman has very dense or glandular breasts, which look much whiter, you could see how hard it would be to spot the abnormal calcifications. Treatment advice can be difficult. The best treatment uh, decisions have to uh, involve what type of surgery, mastectomy or lumpectomy, and what about the lymph nodes. The second issue is hormone therapy, such as tamoxifen. Is that going to be necessary or not? The third question is radiation. Is it necessary to radiate the breast, or can that be skipped? The woman should be assisted in making these decisions by a whole team of doctors, a surgeon, maybe a plastic surgeon as well, the medical oncologist, and the radiation oncologist. The best advice on the Internet can be found on the website of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which is a large group of academic cancer centers. This can be accessed at the website nccn.org. There is a patient site, nccn.com, which is more patient-friendly, but not quite as sophisticated or detailed. But it does have videos and other things that are patient-friendly. If you go to the NCCN guidelines, they are updated constantly. The, sh the version I'm showing at the time of this dictation is version 1.2014, but I assume this will be changed constantly. And they would start out and say the workup for DCIS should include bilateral mammograms reviewing the pathology and determining the estrogen receptor status. The standard treatment for ductal carcinoma in situ is either lumpectomy without lymph node surgery or total mastectomy with or without lymph node surgery. The issue of the lymph nodes, again, is complicated. In general, axillary lymph node dissection should not be performed, but there is a small percent of women who will be found to have invasive cancer, and some surgeons will do a sentinel node biopsy in those patients where lymph node surgery would be more difficult later if perhaps she, the woman had a mastectomy. The decision on surgery, again, can be complicated, lumpectomy or mastectomy. The long-term survival with this cancer is very high. In theory, a mastectomy should cure at least 98% of the women. A lumpectomy is more commonly done than a mastectomy. You remove the cancer with a small rim of normal tissue and attempt to get what are called clear surgical margins. And a sentinel node biopsy can be performed on uh, rare occasions, as discussed elsewhere. At the time of the lumpectomy, the surgeon tries to remove the cancer with a margin of normal breast tissue around it. Radiation is then the next decision, should the patient get postoperative radiation. The standard advice from the NCCN is after a lumpectomy, the woman should receive whole breast radiation. Category 1 means there was no disagreement. They do point out that the uh, long-term studies show that if you do a lumpectomy alone and skip the radiation, the local relapse in the breast is substantially higher. Radiation reduces that by about 50%. There are long-term studies now out to 15 and 25 years showing lumpectomy and radiation has a fairly high local recurrence-free rate, meaning it, uh, the risk of the cancer growing back is small. And there are multiple studies that demonstrate this. And the overall survival with lumpectomy and radiation here out to 15 years, 96% is still extremely high. 
The guidelines do say, however, that clearly radiation will reduce the risk of a relapse in the breast by about 50%. If the cancer recurs in the breast about the half the time, it will be invasive, which can be more serious. There are a number of factors that would determine the risk of a local relapse. Uh, is the tumor palpable, big enough to feel? How big was it? How mutated were the cells, the so-called grade? How close were the surgical margins or edges? And what was the uh, patient's age? Was she young or old? Um, uh, in theory, if the patient is felt to be low risk, um, she can be treated with excision only. There are ways to calculate this. One of the ways to calculate this is the so-called Van Nuys Index from a surgeon in Van Nuys, California. And basically, he says, look at three categories, the pathology type, how big was the cancer, how wide were the margins, and you can develop a score and determine whether lumpectomy alone would be a good strategy, whether lumpectomy and radiation is the better way to go, or whether the risk is so high that maybe even a mastectomy would be advisable. So, for instance, if a patient had comedo cancer under the microscope, the tumor was small, less than 15 millimeters, the margins were only between 1 and 9 millimeters, that would give her a score of 2 plus 1 plus 2, or 5, and the guidelines would say she should get a lumpectomy followed by radiation. The Van Nuys Index was updated recently to include the patient's age, and these tables can be used to calculate the risk or benefit of lumpectomy followed by radiation. There are also online breast calculators that can be very handy. These can all be accessed through the website aboutcancer.com. Memorial Sloan Kettering has a nice calculator for DCIS. So for instance, you would go to their calculator, put in the woman's age, family history, whether the tumor was big enough to feel, uh, whether she's going to get radiation or hormones, the grade, necrosis, the surgical margins. And for instance, I put this in for a high-risk woman. And it would say if she skipped the radiation, she has a 70% risk that it will recur. If she does post-operative radiation, it's 37%. I put in an older woman with low risk features and recalculated that. And the risk if she skips the radiation of the cancer growing back is 16%. And if she does have the radiation, it's only 6%. And again, the woman would have to look at these statistics and decide how she wants to proceed. If the woman decides to have radiation, it generally starts with a so-called CAT scan simulation. Her breast and chest wall is scanned into the computer. The computer will generate all the structures that are important and develop a radiation field or radiation zone as shown here that will hit the breast area and avoid the lung or the heart. In theory, the treatment comes in from one side and goes out the other and should skim over the surface of the chest wall, ribs, and lung. The treatments are normally five days a week, Monday through Friday. There are some shorter radiation schemes available. Generally, the whole breast, the red box, is treated for the first five weeks, and then a boost, the blue circle, is given to the higher risk area. These are shown on different computer reconstructions, as noted here. The side effects of breast radiation are primarily skin irritation and sunburn. Some women have tiredness and fatigue. The risk of arm swelling is very small. The long-term side effects of breast radiation are very small. The risk of uh, underlying damage to the lung or the rib cage is now very small. The NCCN guidelines also give further advice on whether the woman should consider taking a drug called tamoxifen and how often she should get follow-up mammograms and physical exams. All of this information is on the website aboutcancer.com.